Chapter 1 Timothy and the Fountain of Youth Our story begins on September 15th, year 2027. It was a cool autumn day. Timothy, a 10-year-old boy, was going to his favorite place, the Berkshire Museum of Science, History, and Rehabilitation. It's located on an island near Hawaii, called Sparrow Island. It is the only museum on the island. The museum was an interesting place because it brought both discomfort for adults and happiness for kids. This is because the museum partners with a group of people who are not loved by the people in the community but kids really like them. They are the transport children. The transport children run a rehabilitation center for people of varying ages that have gone through dramatic and traumatic experiences with the help of the museum. This of course means that they are often there and in turn makes the patrons there very unhappy. But being as this is the only museum on the island they still go. Today is one of the days the transport children are there. Timothy was super excited to see them. Timothy and his parents would visit the museum once a month. His parents didn't really mind Timothy. Hanging out with the transport children mostly because they didn't live on Sparrow Island. When the thing that made everybody dislike them happened. Also they seem nice, so they let Timothy hang with them. When Timothy and his parents walked through the front door of the Berkshire Museum, they couldn't find the transport children they assumed that they were busy, and decided to go on a tour, because even though they visited once a month, they didn't really know the place that well. They have gotten turned around in the past since they had only visited five times. Towards the end of the tour Timothy needed to go to the restroom. It was just down the hallway near the playroom so they left the tour. His parents waited in the playroom while he was in the restroom after he had washed his hands. He was fixing his black hair that parted to the right of his head, even though it didn't really need fixing because his mom had put gel in it. That morning, he brushed it with a comb. He had pulled out of the pocket of his black pants. He slipped the comb back in his pocket and adjusted his yellow outline plaid shirt. As he was doing this, he was dancing and humming a song that was stuck in his head. He was trying to keep his mind off of the fact that he is by himself and was scared. Later as he was outside the restroom, he heard a strange banging noise down the hallway. The one thing about Timothy is he gets scared very easily so, he ran to the playroom. But in his fear instead of running to the playroom, he ran down the stairs of the basement. The basement wasn't particularly a dangerous place. The transport children actually ran the basement, but it was still off limits to people who didn't work there. For the last few months they were redecorating and remodeling the museum to workers who worked for a company called We Move Anything, was going back and forth with heavy couches and rugs. So the stairs weren't safe that day. The basement stairs door was wide open and was held in place by a bag of rice. Right next to it was a sign that says do not enter. Usually the door was closed and locked with a code only museum workers knew, so that kids wouldn't go down the basement stairs. The sound Timothy heard was the two workers who were walking with an old couch. They were taking down to the basement to wrap it up. For it to be donated to charity, they didn't see Timothy walk down the basement stairs. But none of them could ever guess what was about to happen next. Right at the wall there was an old door that was the old back door to the museum before they dug the basement. It was glued shut but someone busted it open earlier that morning. And at that very moment it swung right open again causing Timothy to fall. He fell a few feet and land onto old couches that were plastic wrapped together. He then bounced up in the air and landed on the edge of an old concrete fountain that was going to be a part of a new exhibit. He died immediately from his neck breaking on the fountain. And then the water started flowing. An ominous red light shined on Timothy and the water as if it were hands grabbed Timothy and pull him into the fountain. The fountain, cascade also known by people as the fountain of youth is colonial coal entered called Miserite, Mizrite and alien polyp with a hard translucent shell. That is often mistaken for crystals, and that is where her trouble begins. Her story begins many, many years ago. Cascade was a normal Miserite that lived in space. When her and her colony of the Miserians Mizrites were mistaken for a crystallized moon by one of the nearby planet inhabitants. They were then sent away by those very same humans to help the people of Earth. The humans from the planet Oceanus which is a planet entirely made of water did not know that the Mazarians were living creatures 
But they did know that the moon was rich in healing properties. They sent a small cluster of the Mazariot moon to the planet Earth, using water from their planet as a catapult. The cluster of Mazariot later landed in a dry field made up of clay that was holding a bunch of sand back from reaching the ocean. That was just on the other side of some mountains that were also made out of clay. They had landed at their destination, the planet Earth, and the occasional rain provided them enough moisture to stay alive. Over the course of a few decades, the dry land began to get heavy rain. The rain carved out space in the field which was already slightly sloped towards the ocean. And that is where the water got stuck. Small hills and tall mountains slowly broke up the clay by the water causing the tall mountains and anything made out of clay to break and float out into the water. This made it so that the water came in from all directions, making a giant wave crash onto the sand. The field turned into a beach from causing the cluster of Mazaria to get wedged in between a mixture of sand and clay. The beachfront was now connected to the ocean. Inhabitants from a faraway land saw the large chunks of clay and worked to get them out of the water. They later sent boats to follow the clay to find its source that it was still coming from. They later docked their boats on the beachfront. The beach that they found was perfect for them to live. They decided to abandon their old village after getting varying items from it. Then they blocked the area. They came in with nets so that no clay could get out and made plans to sell the clay to people who needed it since it was in such great demand. They also didn't want people stealing their boats so they set them on the beach. The Mazarians watched all of this under a small pile of sand and were confused as to why they looked so different from the other humans who sent them there. The part of the ground that the Mazarians was stuck to is now underwater. The beachfront was took over by the pharaoh who was in charge of the village and his queen. The queen was the mastermind behind the plan to sell the clay, although not all people were happy about the queen. Leading the way the pharaoh gave the queen all the credit. If travelers who wanted to buy clay made fun of or accused her of lying about her ingenious plan, he refused to sell to them. The queen saw the Mazarians and mistook them for crystals. She asked her servants to get the crystals out of the water and make them into a necklace. This was bad, because they were actually living in like trees. They have branches and each smaller branch of three to five is a family. And in Cascade's family she has a brother whose shell is blue. His name is Downpour. He is the youngest and a sister whose shell is purple. Her name is Ripple. She is the oldest. Cascade's shell is pink. She's the middle child. They have hearts, brains, and lungs like every living creature. Their hearts however are like the trunk of the tree so in that way they are all connected to one heart. Cascade and her siblings along with the other Mazarians heard a splash as a servant of the queen came in and broke one of the shells in half with a hammer causing the polyp inside to die. This polyp was Ripple. When Downpour and Cascade saw this they were terrified and so were the other Mazarians. Cascade was angry. Cascade later on was brought out of the water and survived. She was put on display on top of a fountain. The water from the fountain ran up a pipe and hit against Cascade causing her healing properties to flow into the water. It also was keeping her alive and allowing her to grow stronger. People soon found out that the water seemed to heal and restore people's strength. Then they began to call her the Fountain of Youth. The queen would come by to drink from the fountain many days wearing the necklace that was made from Ripple's shell. The queen's name was Tulip. The queen and Cascade were able to communicate due to the queen's natural abilities, which she gained from Ripple's DNA. Cascade had nothing but anger and the queen and her quickly became enemies so much so that the queen had the fountain of youth buried under sand. In 1983, many years later, it was found when people were trying to find artifacts in the area she was in. They found Cascade but during their digging they knocked her off of her pedestal. She fell near the fountain. Later one of the cleanup crew members found it and mm -hmm. gave it to the head paleontologist. He put it into a scanner that said it was just plastic and believed it was not an actual part of the artifact. The crew member found it interesting and took it home to his wife. She worked with glass and plastic, making a lamp handle preserving the shell and cascade within it. She then made an entire lamp. The lamp was later passed down to the lamp maker's grandson. Cascade quickly learned to love this young person, letting go of her anger for the first time and she used her abilities to help the young 10-year-old boy understand her.
and his emotions towards the fact that his dad and grandmother who were in a war were presumably dead. To do so she used his inner thoughts to create characters resembling emotions and layers of a human. This eventually was too much for him to handle, eventually causing him to shut down and die in 1984. Cascade became furious and was deeply sad knowing that it was all her fault. She watched as people came in and out of the young boy's room. His name was Edgar. One of them was the museum curator, who got to talking to Edgar's grandpa. His grandpa told the curator about how he had found the crystal on the lamp near the fountain. The curator had always thought that something was missing from that fountain, and asked if he could have the crystal. Edgar's parents agreed and Edgar's mom, who knew Cascade was alive, was both happy for her and sad that she was leaving. She said her goodbyes, and Cascade was returned to the fountain covered with a sheet, and moved to various different places as she was a part of a traveling museum exhibit. But every day she became more and more sad. Several years later she had grown accustomed to the life of traveling and even began to wait, excitedly for, the people who transferred her from museum to museum and even said hi to some of them. They were very confused and thought they were hearing things therefore walked away. One person, Michael, who had been a part of transferring her since the very beginning talked to her many times as if she was alive even though at that point he had not known that she was, which helped her heal knowing that someone who didn't know she's alive still treated her as if she was special. Eventually she spoke to him and he spoke back and then they began to have conversations when he would take her in and out of various places even though people stared at them confused. It was through those conversations that she learned that he was Edgar's nephew and had a son named Timothy and a wife named Ellie. On September 8, 2027 she was in a museum and heard a stranger talking about Mazarians in a dark corner of the museum. It was strange because basically no people knew about their species. And then the stranger said Downpour seems to be sick. My brother is still alive. Cascade said. She tried to break away from the fountain to go to the person but she was stuck. Five days later she was packed up to be moved to the next museum for some reason. Michael wouldn't take her to go find her brother. But she devised a plan to get to her brother. Especially since he might be sick. She made a plan to create mystics. A more advanced version of her species. She was sat in the basement of the Brookshire Museum, and became quite angry again knowing that the person must have known that she too was a miseriate, and just ignored her. Suddenly her frustration was interrupted by a sound of a rusty hinge that echoed throughout the whole basement. Then just a few seconds later the sound of something hitting plastic and then hitting concrete. She then looked to the right of her, and laying on the edge of the fountain was a 10-year-old boy. She then took control of the water and grabbed the boy turning him into a coin that rests at the bottom of the fountain using his DNA to start the creation process of mystics. 